Our next speaker comes with the perspective of a pharmacist, and she's observed important things about healthcare today. On one hand, advances in drug therapy are saving lives and improving care as never before. On the other hand, millions of people are still harmed by prescription drugs. She wants to know, why can't we get meds right? Please welcome Mary Roth McClurg. Thank you all, good morning. I wanted to start off by telling you a little bit about a quote from Dr. Jerry Avorn in the book, Powerful Medicines. If you haven't read it, it's a really great book. In the book, Powerful Medicines, Dr. Avorn writes, every pill we take represents a delicate compromise between the promise of healing, the risk of side effects, and an increasingly daunting price. What's not stated, but implied, are the burdens and the complexities of medication use that are placed on patients, their caregivers, and their families. Medications remain one of the greatest medical interventions of all times. When used wrong, they wreak tremendous havoc and harm, but when used right, their impact is enormous. I'm here today because there's no question that to improve national health care, we must get meds right. You all have seen the data. $3 trillion spent on health care, $270 billion spent on prescription medications, and over $200 billion spent resolving medication-related misadventures and problems. That means that for every $1 we spend on prescription drugs, we spend another dollar trying to resolve a medication-related problem. Those most at risk for medication-related problems are older adults, anyone with chronic illnesses, anyone on multiple medications, chronic conditions. They often see multiple physicians, visit multiple pharmacies. They have rates of non-adherence to their drugs as high as 50%. They're often, despite having multiple chronic conditions and using multiple medications, they often have untreated medical conditions or they're on doses of medications that are often too low. These individuals have frequent hospitalizations, often accounting for up to 70% of all hospitalizations, and many of them preventable, and often at the core are medications. Why does this continue to happen? Like anything in healthcare, care is complex. The system is fragmented, it's ill-coordinated, and team-based care, while improving, is just not where we need it to be. We have a lot of efforts ongoing to improve medication use. We heard this morning about efforts to increase the proportion of patients on beta blockers and diabetes agents. All of these are important strategies. There are a lot of efforts to target patients who are not adherent to their medications to make them more adherent. And there's a lot of efforts to target getting patients on more affordable, affordable drugs, switching them from brand name costly prescriptions to generic alternatives. But that doesn't get at the root of the problem, and many of you are probably familiar with this firsthand. There's no one in our healthcare system, no one, spending time with patients, talking to them about all the medications they are on, the complexities that they face, what they're taking, why they're taking it, how they're taking it. Physicians lack the time, others lack the expertise, and still others are not practicing at the top of their license. And finally, payment is just simply not aligned to support this type of service or this type of care within our healthcare system. There's no question that to improve national health care, we must do better and we must get meds right. So I'd like now to turn to some personal reflections over my 20 years of being a pharmacist spending my time both as a pharmacist practicing in the clinical environment and then also as a researcher and to share with you some of the things we've been working on. Nearly 20 years ago when I graduated from pharmacy school and completed residency training, my very first job was working as a clinical pharmacist embedded in a primary care physician's office in Durham, North Carolina. My job as a clinical pharmacist in that clinic, my space in the clinic was right in the heart of the primary care space with the physician colleagues and nurses and social, works and social workers and others. And my job was to help the team get meds right. 
physicians, nurses, others within the team would refer patients to me for polypharmacy. They're just simply on too many medications. Uncontrolled chronic conditions help us, you know, patients can't afford medications, help us identify affordable alternatives. So patients would, physicians would refer patients to me, I would see them, conduct a comprehensive medication history with the patient. Oftentimes this took about an hour because these individuals were often on multiple medications. Conduct a comprehensive medication history with them, formulate an assessment and a plan for how to do better, and make that recommendation to, to the physician and together we would incorporate that plan into the patient's, into the patient's health care plan. I'll never forget a gentleman who was referred to me by one of my physician friends and colleagues, and he said, I'm going to refer this gentleman to you. He's not really on that many medications. He's only on four, so I really don't know what's going on here. He has insomnia that's new. He's had a bump in his serum creatinine, so something's going on with his kidney function, and I just can't seem to get his blood pressure under control. I simply don't have time to spend with him. Can you help? And so I called the individual on the phone prior to him coming into clinic, and I said, you know, this is how we work. I, we had seen some of his, his friends before, and I said, please bring in all your medications, prescription, over-the-counter, herbal, anything you have at home, whether you're using it or not. So he walks into the clinic that morning. He pulls out the medications out of his bag, and he lines up 14 pill bottles. And he sits there, and he says, I'm so glad someone is finally going to take time to go through all of my medications with me. But I have one request. And by the way, four of those were the prescription medications in the medical record. The others were not in the medical record, and many of them were herbals and alternative and complementary medicines. He says, I have one request. You can do anything you want, and I'll listen. But you can't get rid of my colon cleanser. It's the only thing that makes me feel better. And so I said, okay, we won't get rid of your colon cleanser. And this was really a, an important point and something we often teach our students today is to listen to the patient. And so I went through all of his medications, wrote down everything he had, compared it to the medical record, talked to him about what he was taking, why he was taking it, and what he wasn't taking and why. And after we went through about an hour's discussion, I established a rapport, he trusted me, I trusted him, I finally said, I think I know what's going on with your medications. Let me go get the physician. And sometimes the physician would be in practice that day, and other times he wouldn't. And so I'd find a way to reach out to him. And I said, I think I know what's going on here. He's taking most of his medications in the morning with his colon cleanser, which is binding them, thereby limiting their absorption and not reaching their full effect. He's taking one medication at night an antidepressant. Why he chose to take that one at night, I'm not sure, but one of the side effects is insomnia. He doesn't have insomnia. He has a side effect from a prescription medication. It's a simple fix. Move it to the morning, two hours apart from his colon cleanser, of course. <laughs> and then the third problem, there were several problems that, that day, but these were the three priorities. The third problem was that he was taking two non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs on top of an herbal diuretic all likely contributing to the bump in serum creatinine, his declining kidney function, and obviously still had uncontrolled pain. When I talked to him about why he had two different non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, he had no idea that they were both non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. He said, well, I just got out of the hospital two weeks ago and I got the prescription for this one, and this one I've had in my cabinet for the past two years. And so my pain wasn't controlled, so I thought I'll take this pain medicine and this pain medicine and put them together. The point being here is that by spending one hour with this gentleman, we were able to assess what was going on with his medications in totality, make recommendations for optimizing his care, and improving his clinical goals and making him feel better. He actually, it was important that we continue to arrange follow-up with him to follow him over time. It's not just a one-time thing. We were able to remove some of his medications and convince him that he didn't need them. And in one case, we actually had to start a new medication. The problem here is that there were so many patients like him that I spent about 12 years of my career seeing. Part of the problem is that medication optimization in a patient-centered way like I experienced with him is not a valued component of our healthcare environment. 
It's not something that is paid for, it's not incentivized, and it's not rewarded. Thereby limiting the type of services that pharmacists and others like myself and other healthcare professionals are able to provide to patients. And I say all of this because it's so important that we look at how we can modify our current environment and try to fix these problems with medication optimization. So what if our healthcare system valued the time spent with patients listening, coordinating their care around their medication use, getting them to clinical goals, getting them on the right medications and off of the wrong ones? What if patients became more educated and informed and empowered to become involved in the management and the self-management of their medications? What if we as healthcare professionals learned to work better together, capitalizing on the unique skills and strengths that we each bring to the table? What if we trained the next generation of aspiring healthcare professionals to listen, to coordinate, to improve care, to collaborate, and to communicate with each other? And what if payment were aligned to value the patient and the medication complexities and burdens that they face? much like many of the talks we heard this morning about listening to the patient and coordinating care. So when I left clinical practice many years ago, I did so to return to graduate school and explore opportunities around research in order to advance and accelerate this type of care so that more patients like the gentleman I saw in the clinic that day could reap the benefit of personalized and individualized approaches to medication use. I'd like to share with you now some of the work we have ongoing in North Carolina, but please know that this work is ongoing in other states, California and throughout the country as well. Part of the, um, part of the options that we have and some of the work that we're doing focuses on predictive analytics and looking at tools and ways to use analytics and logistics to identify patients most at risk for medication-related problems those who are being hospitalized on too many medications at risk for side effects, and so that we can target and tailor this type of care to those individuals. We're also looking at new delivery models. We have some work ongoing in the community pharmacy setting, looking to capitalize on pharmacists working in the independent community pharmacy setting in partnership with physicians' offices to become that care liaison between the pharmacy where the patient is going almost 30 times a year compared to the physician's clinic where they may be going two or three times a year. How do we coordinate care around medication use to optimize it between those in the pharmacy and those in the doctor's office, and move the pharmacist's role away from the dispensing of the drug product, which is still important, but place it more on medication optimization and the true value they bring to that patient. We're also exploring some similar care delivery models in the primary care setting. Pharmacists embedded in the clinics, much like I was for about 12 years of my career, what are best practices for integrating and incorporating pharmacists into these environments? What are they doing and how are they doing it? How can we finance this to, to ensure that those at greatest risk for medication-related problems are receiving this care? Those are just some examples of the work that's ongoing throughout the United States and in other areas to, to expand and accelerate medication optimization as a critical component of healthcare reform. And finally, perhaps one of the most rewarding um, and complex projects I've worked on to date is the transformation of health professions education. At the UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy, we committed nearly three years, in ago, three years ago to doing better. We are one of the top pharmacy schools in the country, and we asked ourselves, what are we preparing? What do pharmacists need to be doing in 2020 and beyond? And we looked at ourselves, and we said, we can do better. So we as a faculty committed to wiping the slate clean, literally, and starting over. We re-engineered an entire new curriculum for doctor of pharmacy students at the UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy to prepare them to, pro to provide continual improvement to health and health care when they graduate in 2019 and beyond. Yes, of course, we need to teach them everything they need to know about drugs and diseases and medications and pharmacology, but more importantly, we need to teach them how to work together with others, be adaptable, be problem solvers, innovate, coordinate care, listen, and so on. We've placed a big emphasis on better preparing them and positioning them to have real impact when they graduate. It was just as important to us 
that we transform aspiring healthcare professionals as we do in looking at transforming the current healthcare professional workforce. So in closing, I'd like to return to Dr. Avorn's quote from the book Powerful Medicines. He writes, every pill we take represents a delicate compromise between the promise of healing, the risk of side effects, and an increasingly daunting price. For so many Americans, this problem has just spun out of control. It's now pill upon pill upon pill. They are burdened with medication complexities in managing their medications, and we must help. For all of you, at some point, you will be a consumer of health care or you will be a caregiver of others. And I can guarantee you, you too will be consumed with the burden of medication complexities and you will find yourself asking why. And I can also guarantee you that for every positive experience you have, you'll also have an experience that's wreaked with havoc and harm. And again, you'll find yourself asking why. So I'm here again to say that to improve national health care, we must get meds right. I'd like to leave you with three strategies that I think we can work on now to do better. The first is something I spoke about earlier. We must improve care delivery to place value on the patient, all of his or her medications, spend time with him or her listening to what's behind those 14 bottles. There's a story there. And if we don't spend time listening to the patient, we'll never discover that story. We'll never prevent side effects. We'll never advance the promise of healing. Second, we have to align payment to support this type of work. Medication optimization and getting meds right is a critical component of healthcare reform. And finally, even though all of you aren't involved intimately in health professions education, at some point, I'm sure you will touch a learner, whether it's a medical student, a nursing student, a social work student, a pharmacy student, or whomever. I ask that you do what you can to inspire them, to instill in them a love for continually improving health and health care, and to do what you can to help re-engineer health professions education. They are our future. Thank you.